Hi, welcome to another knowledge sharing module from the Client Experience and Professional Services Community, CXPS. So glad you're here with us today. This week, we have issue number 13 from Chad Kleinhens, the CEO at Zwei Group. And Chad will be talking to us about the best firms to work for, what they're doing, what the winners are doing to win the hearts and minds of their employees. I know this is always such an important topic as we're always looking for and fighting for the top talent in the industry. Before I turn this over to Chad, let me take just a moment to thank all of our sponsors. Thank you very much sponsors for your continued support. We appreciate all that you do for us in this community. Please take some time to learn about these sponsors. Following uh, Chad's message today, we'll talk about when you can ask Chad some questions and learn more about how to engage in the CXPS community. But for now, Chad, take it away. Well, thank you for having me today. I'm delighted to be speaking for CXPS. Today, I'm gonna to look at the largest employee data set in the AEC industry. It's Swigroup's Group's annual list of best firms to work for. I'm gonna talk about the impact of the employee experience on the client experience and how that defines your brand. So let's start at a very high level. Let's just talk about what a brand is. And there's a bit of misunderstanding in this industry about brand. I mean, certainly it, your website colors, all of those things are elements of the brand, but the brand is actually much bigger than a lot of people uh, think about it. It's everything. It is the way your product or service is perceived by everyone and not just clients, but also employees. So we have to recognize that written words, images, the things you say and do all affect the brand. So those two elements, both the client side and the employee side are both so important to consider. I love this quote by Richard Branson. It says, clients do not come first, employees come first. If your employees, if you take care of your employees, they will take care of your clients. I remember the first time I heard this uh, many, many years ago, I was working with an engineering firm out of the Midwest and they really emphasized this and it kind of took me aback. But, but as we have uh, learned more about the employee experience through this massive data set, and really studied branding, this really is, uh, this is absolutely fundamental to building a strong brand. So let's talk a little bit more about brand. Uh, I like this definition because it uh, really captures kind of a measurable for brand, which resonates with people in this industry. It's this concept called brand equity. So it's brand equ equity is a set of assets and liabilities linked to the brand's name or symbol that adds to or subtracts from the value provided by your service, your AEC firm, to your clients. So we, if we look at the brand in measurable terms, there's this equation, assets plus liabilities equals brand equity. So when we look at brand equity in AEC uh, and recognize that most of us are providing a service, not necessarily like a product that we sell on the shelf, we can see that our assets are going to be largely made up of people. Our liabilities are also going to be largely made up of people. So the brand equity is highly affected by and almost completely controlled by our people. Okay. This does reinforce the importance of the employee experience and how that affects the overall brand. So let's define employee experience. So employee experience, and uh, we say EX, is every touch point the employee has with their job. It includes how the culture feels, how they develop, how they are affected by the client, everything. And there's a number of definitions out there of employee experience, but we really just want to think about it as broadly as we can. And how we measure the employee experience is this best firms to work for. So it's the only national program that looks at all AEC firms in North America, uh, so both the U.S. and Canada. Now, there are a number of local programs like Best Places to Work, uh, but this is really the national stage and, and also yields the highest amount of data in the industry. We quantify that with 12,000 responses, over 12,000 responses yielding 1.7 million data points on employee experience in the AC industry. So it really provides an incredible perspective of what firms are doing 
to make their firms the best place to work. So what we're going to do here is we're going to look at the data and we're going to see how 2020, which the, this uh, survey, just to kind of give you an idea of when we were collecting these 12,000 responses, this was uh, in the time frame of February of 2020 to all the way uh, closer to June. So that window of time. So we all know right in the middle of that was when COVID hit. And so we saw the biggest shift in data that we've ever seen in the program. So let's just look at kind of overall what the best firms to work for uh, data set yields. And then let's look at uh, also how it trended during COVID. So this is where employees rank their firm the highest. My firm strives to improve is number one. Okay, obviously saying that it, to employees, it's very, very important that their company has a vision uh, is willing to chain in a constant uh, state of improvement. Secondly, I feel my firm is ethical and its business practice is obviously very important. Employees want to trust their leaders and trust the business practices. And then thirdly, pride, proud of their work. My firm provides high quality work for the clients. So these are all three very important elements uh, to employees. Now let's look at where the best firms to work for data set ranks their firms the lowest. Merson, kind of obvious, frequency of raises and bonuses, we can't get enough of those, right? Um, but the second one is something that I really want to highlight, and that is compensation for extraordinary effort. Uh, and this is something that as the industry has become very busy, our data sets and all of our other uh, surveys, uh, along with this one, reinforce that the industry is working at the highest levels of production ever in our 30 years of, of running data on the industry. And so this compensation for extraordinary effort is something that's so critical. And this can be everything from just uh, verbal recognition to monetary rewards, it spans. There's many different ways that uh, employers are doing this as we uh, really look into the data. And then thirdly, employee subpar work is addressed. This is something that has really climbed in the rankings the last several years. And what it says, and it should say to you, is that it is really important that team members are held accountable for, for performing at a level that the obviously the organization wants to perform at. And if there's somebody that's not pulling their weight, it's, it's a bigger problem, especially when we're busy and we've got to rely on our team members. Firm leaders are having a tougher time getting rid of these people because it's hard to recruit right now. Recruiting and retention is the number one challenge in the industry. And so it's really important that we look at these things and we come up with strategies on how to address them. Address them. So looking at the overall data set for the last three years, I thought I would just share some of the things that are trending up. As you can see from this graph, effective communication, uh, firm-wide financial information, ethical business practices, and telecommuting. And of course, you can see the telecommuting had a, a pretty sharp rise there in 2020, obviously because of what happened during COVID. Now, what has been trending down for the last three years, satisfaction with work experience, uh, fairness and consistencies in policies and decisions. Again, this kind of goes back to that thing where are we dealing with people fairly? Are we allowing underperformance to slide by because we need productivity? All of these things are a big issue and have become uh, a greater issue. Uh, management showing compassion in times of need. This is interesting how sharply uh, that one dropped along with job security course in 2020. Uh, job security had the sharpest drop and that was obviously fueled uh, by um, uncertainty about what was gonna happen with COVID. So now let's look at the data that actually we looked at pre-COVID, which was kind of that that second week of March when, when you know, the U.S. hit the red button on this, and then after COVID. So where scores plummeted uh, after COVID was, of course, number one, I feel my job is secure without the threat of downsizing event in the coming year. Quality of raises, bonuses, and benefits. You know, there were a number of firms that had to cut pay. Uh, some just the leadership team, some the entire firm had to pay, take pay reductions. And, and a lot of that was fueled by uncertainty. Some of it was fueled by, you know, work actually did decrease. Uh, and then three, management shows compassion to employees in times of need. Um, so a little bit of a lack of empathy. And it might have just been that people weren't together and it wasn't as easy to communicate that. 
But here's what's interesting where scores soared. Number one is obvious, telecommuting. Number two, I feel things are communicated effectively in my firm. And this was interesting because you would actually think that communication would be difficult in the virtual environment. But what we saw is that people just picked up the phone and talked maybe more than they actually did when they were sitting on the other side of the wall from them in the office. And then three, mentoring. I think people did feel like they were actually getting better connected to their leaders. A lot of the leaders I talked to were doing all hands meetings every week, you know, and, and a lot of employees said, you know, I, I, I didn't hear from the CEO once a week. It was more like once a quarter. Right. And, and so it's really interesting to see how things trended. So as we look forward, I think it's going to be very interesting in now that we've got this data set and we are just now taking the 2021 data set. It's going to be really interesting to see uh, what type of data we get in the next few months, because we all know things haven't changed much since we went into COVID. So let's talk about return on investment. What can we do with data? What can we do with insight into what the industry is doing and then also what our our uh, own employees believe. Um, let's talk about where we should invest. The, the survey does give us some indication where uh, we should be focusing our efforts. Now, the number one challenge, which has been every single year uh, that I have, have been watching this data has been communication. In other words, communication is the thing that, that employees feel is in most need of improvement or at least satisfied with. But what's interesting is that this actually changed for the first time ever post COVID and work-life balance took its spot. And, and I've said, you know, it may not be, you know, maybe before we were trying to figure out um, how to fit our life into our work. And that was the work-life balance, spending lots of time at the office. And now maybe it's reversed for those who find themselves at home. How do I fit my work? into my life. And so this has been interesting how this became the number one challenge, unseated uh, communication. So let's put our time and attention toward not only trying to solve communication, making sure that's very strong during COVID, but also after COVID, as we know, that's always going to be something that's so important, but also work-life balance. And we're going to talk about this here as we look at 2021 going forward. Also spending your time in uh, enhancing the number one benefit, which is training and development. So for several years now, training and development has soared to now the number one most valued benefit. And I think this is very reflective of the changing generations and the interest in the younger generations, a, a real sincere interest in development and career progression and an ambition that is, they believe is, can be fueled by a good training and development program. So I think you can really set yourself apart if you can go beyond what the standard firm is doing in the area of training and development. So looking at uh, some of the interesting things where we looked at uh, the generation gaps, speaking of generation, we actually separated our data set into two age groups, as you can see here. So 18 to 45 years, and then 45 years and older. And this set of uh, five uh, items is where the uh, younger generation was least satisfied or rated the firm's lowest and the older generation ranked the firm the highest. So this is where the greatest disparity was. Parental leave, compensation for extraordinary effort, base salary, level of compensation reflects my workload, and the firm makes an effort to keep compensation competitive. Okay, what's really interesting is actually when we flip it and we say, well, where was the, uh, where's the younger generation the most satisfied and the older generation the least? And it is these five items. I have opportunities for career growth at my firm. So that, that is good that the younger generations are, feel um, encouraged by that. I take the review process seriously and prepare adequately. Now, this is something that's very important. So this just captures, and this and also number three, management takes an interest in my professional development, captures what I said about training and development and interest in the younger generation. They're saying, this is very important to me. And those in the older generation, which are often tasked with managing these processes, are ranking it as least 
important to them. Okay. So, so this is something, again, we can really look at and say, hey, in our firm, if this is important to some part of our, our employee group, are we doing the things we really need to do to give that the time and focus? There are opportunities for continued financial gain at my firm and positive relationships exist among employees at my firm. Okay. So going back to this return on investment, what do we do with all this data? Really zooming out, it really does start with making employees feel trusted and respected, right? So part of that respect is, you know, it, hey, if training development is important to you or our annual review is important to you, I'm going to make sure I do it and I do it on the timeline that I said I would do it, right? So many opportunities, okay? The thing about trust, though, um, is that trust and respect is affected by freedom, right? Okay. But as companies grow, they tend to increasingly contain freedom as more rules and procedures are created to control risk, right? So it is really important for us to think about how do we scale our companies and we still allow employees to have like that sense that we trust them and that we give them the freedom to be able to work effectively and productively. And we're going to talk some more about this because we are at a very interesting time right now. It's kind of a, a point where we now know we're kind of headed towards a post COVID reality. We've got to think about what does freedom look like in the future and trust, right? So it requires us to be very, very clear on the brand promise. So that communication side is also very important. Employees have got to understand their role, okay? They've got to be developed and be empowered to deliver, and they've got to be rewarded for success, okay? So if we want to make sure that as we scale the company, we're, we're really being clear as to what we're trying to do, we maintain trust and freedom, and we do it in a way that we're still able to control risk without making a very bureauc bureaucratic organization, Where's the most effective place to start in developing this strategy and communication? Well, it's your strategic plan. And I would just say, if you're watching this and you do not have one, do one now. Now is the time. Uh, if you have one, make sure everyone knows what's in the plan. That may sound weird to you because we think, well, strategic plan's got to be some kind of a secret you know, playbook of how we're going to do things. No, strategic plan needs to be a document that says to the organization, this is where we want to go and this is how we're going to do it. And we don't worry about some employee taking that to a competitor because any good strategic plan is going to be based on your firm uniquely. And it's not going to work for anybody else. It's what your firm's going to do, right? So your strategic plan is where you need to start. And I think now's the best time to do one because we really do have a new reality setting up. And I'm not even going to use the word new normal. It's a new reality that we are in somewhat control of uh, as COVID restrictions lift. And we talk about the future of work in AEC it starts with strategic plan. So let's look real quickly at the stats. Businesses using strategic plans are 12% more profitable. 95% of the a uh, typical workforce doesn't understand the organization strategy. So strategic plans, you're 12% more profitable, right? It's great. Yet really 95% of the typical workforce doesn't understand strategy. So we've got to have these strategic plans. 86% of executive teams spend less than an hour a month discussing strategy. Well, I don't know what uh, your definition of executive team is, but it really is they should be the holders of the strategy. So the stats are really low out there. More than 70% of companies with strategic plan don't execute it. So the bars are really low. Yet it is really, this is the tangible to that number one most important and highly ranked item in the survey, my firm strives to improve, right? So this is the game plan for constant improvement. And that first bullet, we're going to be more profitable. It's just yet the first thing that really provides power in a strategic plan. So... Any good part of a strategic plan is going to be, you know, enhancing and focusing on the employee experience. So let's talk about how you can excel in the employee experience. So at least solicit feedback from your employees and clients consistently, right? Don't overdo it. Don't underdo it. 
you know, choose the ways that you are going to interact with your employees and your clients and, and then be very consistent about that. You know, constantly listen through other means, not just a survey they have to take on the internet. Constantly listen and make adjustments based on the feedback you're hearing. This is called gap analysis, right? What are the gaps? How do we uh, close, close on them? And just really commit to continual improvement, which is uh, really empowered by a strategic plan. And recognize that happy, employees create happy clients. That's what we got to do to be successful in this industry, which is getting highly competitive, more competitive every single day. We really need to stand out among our competitors. We've got to have happy clients. Well, that starts with happy employees, right? And when we have happy clients, their satisfaction is translated into what's called brand loyalty, which gives us pricing power, which is something that's very important. So we got to recognize that our people define our brand in AEC. The employee experience, EX, drives the client experience, which ultimately drives growth. Okay. We also have to re recognize that it's a bit of a reciprocal relationship where happy clients also create happy employees, right? And so it's something, it's kind of a beautiful thing that works together, recognizing that the strategies that we employ on both ends benefit us on the other end. Certainly, it's a worthy investment. Companies with CX or client experience uh, with excellent CX have uh, are 1.5 times more engaged. The employees are 1.5 times more engaged. That's significant, right? So that right there says good client experience actually engages our employees and enhances their experience. So companies with highly engaged employees then outperform their competitors by 147%. So this is great, worthy investment, but unfortunately only 32% of workers feel engaged in their work. So again, the bar's low. So strategies that you employ in this area really do go a long way towards giving yourself a competitive advantage. So let's look at the competitive advantage translated in the data. So we've got this metric, we've got average performing firms from Zwei Group's massive data set of firms all across North America. And then there's the best firms to work for us. We separate those data sets and we say, we look at the metrics of return on investment and they're pretty compelling. So pre-tax, pre-bonus profit on net service revenue, 20.8% versus 15%. That's 28% higher in best firms to work for. Net service revenue per full-time employee. You can see the difference here. That's 10% higher. Profit per FTE, 34% higher. Overhead rate is actually 9% lower, right? Chargeability, 3% higher. Return on owner's equity, 21% higher. Backlog in months, 30% higher. Now, if that doesn't make the case, nothing will. So there's the data. Now let's look at 2021 and beyond and what you can do uh, to make sure that you are equipped to come out of COVID stronger than ever. One of the things I think we've got to think about is that we are in a time period right now that is really an opportunity for AEC as the industry overall to kind of experience a quantum evolution. Uh, and a quantum evolution in areas that we've lagged other industries like workplace flexibility, diversity, technology. Okay, but this is going to require leaders to be very intentional about what they want to do going forward. So 2021 should provide us more control. There's kind of this return of control. We're not having to stay home, maybe because of local mandates. We don't have, you know, having to shut an entire office down because we, we've got a case of COVID. So, so as those thing, dis, things dissipate and we kind of get back to, you know, being able to uh, decide what we want to do and when we want to do it. This return of control is going to be very important because now we're going to be able to make decisions in the way we work, right? Now we can define what we want going forward. Okay. So AEC firm leaders are going to have to think very hard about what the future of work looks like in their firms. Okay. And be intentional to make it a reality. So the return of this control should not be taken lightly, nor should it control to the default. Hey, let's just get back to the way things were. This disruption that we have all experienced together 
has allowed us as an industry to make some much needed advances together. Consider those and other things in your firm and what you'll harness to get a competitive advantage in the future. 2021 will be a year where you decide what you want to leave behind and what you will take with you in the future. Okay. We also have an opportunity to define the future culture. And this is something that I think is very powerful because again, I think there's been concern that culture is somehow eroded during COVID. It's just changed. I will say that, you know, many firms have been worried about their culture uh, being negatively impacted, maybe just by the lack of company picnics and water cooler talk. But I'll submit that I think cultures are still very much intact. And it's really more importantly, what do we, what do we say, what, what are we going to do in the future? What are the practices that we're able, that we're willing to, um, to hold on to? What are we willing to learn through this COVID experience to enhance the future of work? Again, another tremendous opportunity for competitive advantage. Just strike the word new normal from your thinking, okay? That new normal kind of communicates it's like something that we're just going to have to accept. Like there's some new normal coming and that's just the way it's going to be. You're really in control of what the future looks like. It brings up another important point about employee engagement uh, in a flexible model, because I do think that's very critical in this whole, what does the future of work look like? Flexibility, finally, is going to be absolutely key. How firm leaders define flexibility post COVID will absolutely be key. The balance of flexibility while uniformly delivering on the brand promise will be more challenging as we uh, go ahead. Figuring out a work model that extends the flexibility, because I do think that's very important, while delivering uniformly and, and, and efficiently will be another competitive advantage. Okay, so your employee experience design will need consistency and uniformity. To get that, you're gonna have to have clarity around what that looks like and do an excellent job of communicating it. After all, employees do define the brand and the client experience. So 2021 brings the challenge of defining a new work model that we're willing to go with long-term that considers how employees want to work and how your firm can sustainably deliver the brand promise to your clients. And as we go forward, we have to think about all of these things that we just talked about and how those will define the best firm to work for of the future. And we are in control of that now, but now the clock is ticking because we really are on a path to um, work our way out of COVID and, and restore some more uniformity in how the organization operates and what the employee experience looks like. So as a leader, you need to really be thinking about that now. If you don't have a strategic plan, develop one and think about how can you come out of this bigger, better, and stronger. Thank you very much for your time. And thanks for joining CXPS. Chad, thank you so much for that very important message. I appreciate it. I know I like to emulate the winners and learn from the best what's working. So I appreciate hearing those stories and those patterns of success. I appreciate you sharing those message. If you have any questions for Chad, he will be live with us this Friday, February 26th at 1 p.m. Eastern time. This Q&A session with Chad is available to members of the CXPS community. If you're not yet a member of CXPS, invite you to join us. You can visit clientexperience.org to learn all you need to know about us. And we do hope you'll join us so we can see you on Friday. We'll have 30 minutes of Q&A with Chad and then 30 minutes of roundtable discussion with your peers to talk about whatever CX and EX topics are close to mind for you. Hope to see you there.